Hey, everybody. I've been told to tell you to settle the fuck down, so please get quiet. This is a very important story. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, in 1731, a bunch of farmers in northern France were seen running back to the closest village screaming that they just saw the devil and they just saw Satan. So, they did what you do when you see the devil. You get the biggest, meanest dog that you can find and you bring it back to that um, orchard that they were coming from and they took the dog, they sicked it on the tree where they thought Satan was hiding. And um, a little figure climbed down from the tree holding a big stick and it beat the dog to death with the stick and then danced on its corpse. So it turned out that Satan was in fact a 10 year old girl. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, woo. Um, <laughs> so this 10 year old girl uh, carrying a really big stick and they thought, okay, well maybe how you get a, a 10 year old girl down from a tree isn't with an angry dog but in fact, something more maternal, something less threatening. So they actually sent out a woman holding a baby to bring her down from the tree and, and some root vegetables for some reason. And, <laughs> and sure enough, it worked. So she, she climbed down and they grabbed her and brought her back to the closest chateau. And they wanted to present her to the Viscount Epinoy because he loved weird shit. And they brought her to his kitchen and she saw something that she loved there, which is raw meat. And she immediately ate it, and they thought, that's interesting. So then they gave her a live rabbit, and she cracked its neck, drank its blood, skinned it, and then ate its raw meat as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a role model for us all. Um, so she then, um, they, they thought, okay, we need to clean her up a little bit for the Viscount. So they washed her, and originally they thought that she was black. But after they washed her, they realized that she'd actually been painted black for some reason. And they were getting really confused about what was going on with this girl, but they assumed that she's one of them feral children that they've been hearing about. So in the 1700s, the Enlightenment was at large in Europe, and people were thinking a lot about feral children. There was one in particular that people were talking a lot about, and this is, um, his name was Peter of Hanover. And I'm about to show you a picture of him. Just to warn you, he's a total little shit, okay? So this is what he looked like. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's rough. Um, but he was found, he's like four or five years old, and they found him in the forest of Germany, just naked, feasting on twigs and berries, barely surviving. And King George of England was like, that sounds great, let's bring him on over. And he kept him in his castle for 70 years. So he actually grew up, his hair stayed amazing. And he, so what was really interesting about feral children at the time was their use of language. So Peter, in his 70 years of life, he only learned to say two things. He learned to say his own name and King George's name. And people who were trying to classify what it meant to be human were really fascinated by this fact. There was this, they started considering this distinction between what, what separated apes, specifically, actually, um, they're really interested in orangutans. They thought they were the closest link to humans, and humans. So. Um, Carl Linnaeus, for example, was starting to organize how everything was connected, and he actually thought that feral children were the missing link between, yeah, yeah, science, between, <laughs> between um, orangutans and humans. Some people actually thought that feral children were the product of bestiality, and that they were actually born from bears or wolves that got it on, that got it on with a very brave human. So um, this is the Viscount Epinoy, and this is the, the person to which they delivered Memmi, um, which is what they ended up naming her. So she was kept as a, a pet um, at a shepherd's house who like, lived in a village near the Viscount. And he would just always call on her whenever he wanted to impress some guests, like, look at what I have. And she was wild, so to speak. Whenever he tried to like bring her to a dinner party, she didn't understand that people ate like cooked food that was confusing to her. She's like, there's nothing here that you can eat. So she'd go to the riverbed and get a bunch of live frogs and try to put them on people's plates. And when they wouldn't eat them, she would just throw them at their faces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she was great. Um, but one time there was like a major blizzard and they couldn't find her at the shepherd's house. They looked for her everywhere. And they found her sleeping atop a tree in a blizzard, and they thought, okay, we can't just let her keep doing this anymore. We have to bring her somewhere else. So, they, um, so the Viscount sent her to a convent to turn her into a lady. 
Yeah, yeah. But the, so what the convent thought, how you become a lady, is that you stop drinking blood. And <laughs> she, she did not care for that. Um, so she, <laughs> yeah, so they, they forced her to stop drinking blood. And I know that it's funny, but it actually was really hard on her body. Um, she, this is a girl who needs blood. And she lost all of her teeth and her fingernails. And she got really, really, really sick. So um, she got super sick from this diet of cooked meat and salt, salted foods and wine. So they were like, okay, she's gonna die soon, so we better baptize her. And then they named her, and this is what they named her. Oh. <laughs> I know, Marie Angelique Mémé Leblanc. And to break that down a little bit, Marie is for the Virgin Mary. Angelique, because she's so angelic. <laughs> Mémé, because uh, she was named after the godfather of the convent, and then Leblanc, the white, for a girl who's painted black and covered in dirt. And just as a reminder, this is who they named Marie Angelique Mémé Leblanc. <laughs> So she was living in this convent in Chalon, and she was lauded for her purity, and I love this story. She was considered really pure because she hated it when people touched her. So this nobleman heard, like, this girl don't, don't want to be touched. Well, he's like, well, I'm a man, so I definitely deserve to touch her. So he went and found her. She was sitting in the attic, feasting on a leg of some animal and just, like, eating this raw meat in the corner of an attic. And he asked the, the people working at the convent to hold her clothing and to touch her. And she literally beat him. <laughs> beat him away with her. With the leg of raw meat. So that's what a pure lady looks like. <laughs> she was no longer allowed to run or climb or swim because that's unladylike. So she learned French. And she's the only feral children who learned to uh, speak a fluent language after being recovered. And uh, she learned to embroider. And um, so the Queen of Poland at the time heard about her, and she demanded that the nuns let her run and climb and swim once more because she wanted a hunting partner. And she was dope at hunting. She was really good at it. So there was a lot of arguments. The Queen of Poland was demanding that she get to take her back uh, to, to Poland as a hunting partner, but the convent was able to convince her, like, no, um, this, this wild child needs to be brought fully to God. Yeah, I agree. Um, so she wanted to become, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's science at work right there. Um, she, she actually, after about 15 years living in the convent, she really wanted to become a nun, but she could feel all of the other nun eyes on her all the time, judging her. She felt like she could never really be part of this community. And so she left. She left for a different convent uh, pretty close by, and she was sought out by this other guy called Lord Condamine. He was a, a famous empiricist at the time, and he only tried to find her because he wanted to prove her as a hoax. And he, he, sought, yeah, he sought her out, uh, was sure that she was a hoax, and then as soon as he found out she wasn't, he got bored and left. <laughs> so um, then she was passed over to the care of the Duke d'Orleans, um, but he died really quickly, and she moved to Paris and was broke and got very sick. Like Her, her body had never actually recovered um, to the circumstances of eating cooked meat. So at this time, she was, it was about 1952 when she was found by a local biographer named Madame de Hequette. And she was um, this Parisian widow who survived writing biographies on interesting characters. So at the time, a lot of people weren't sure who this strange woman was who looked like a normal French woman, spoke fluent French, but was missing all of her teeth. So a lot of people just thought she was some sort of weird hoax. But this is actually the first time in her 30 to 40 years of life that somebody actually asked her, what the hell happened to you? Like, where did you come from? You speak French, we can communicate with you. You have a story to tell, what is it? So Hiquette was actually able to persuade um, Marie Angelique that she could write a biography in exchange for allowing Mammy to sell all of uh, the books to actually um, survive. And it gets even more interesting. It turns out that Mammy was not born in France. She was not born in Europe. She was born in North America. And she was actually Native American. She came from what was assumed to be Labrador uh, in Canada, present day Canada, but some people say maybe she was born in uh, Wisconsin. She talked about how she was born in this very cold place where children learned to swim before they could learn to walk. And she was captured by some slave traders who painted her black because it was much easier to sell a black slave than it was to sell what appeared to be a white slave. And she was brought somewhere. Yeah, ships. 
uh, she was brought somewhere that she considered unbearably hot, where she didn't do very well. And there, so you may remember this picture from before, but you may have not seen this little purse in the corner. Um, yeah, no, not, not Waldo, Waldo's to come. Um, this girl was actually traveling with Meme for years before she was found. So they were both loaded onto another ship in, in uh, Jamaica and brought all the way over to Europe um, where people have different stories. The first story was just that the, the slave owners got tired of them, the two girls, because they were just so unbelievably wild. But some people say that they actually shipwrecked and swam to shore. Yeah, the, the slave owners like got on a rescue boat and they're like, we don't really care about the little girls. And the little girls swam to shore and they landed in Nether the Netherlands. So according to Memi, they mostly traveled and hunted by night and had no shared language. They just communicated through grunts and gestures. And it's not really sure, clear how long they traveled for, but it was assumed to be years. Um, they traveled for approximately 400 miles between Zuiderzee Zee in the Netherlands and Champagne. And they mostly got along until one day they saw something shiny. So they, they found a, a necklace, yeah, um, out, out in the open. And uh, they got in a big fight, and Meme beat the shit out of her. And um, so they just kind of decided we better go separate ways. And that was just three days before Meme was found in the town. Um, yeah, there's Waldo looking through the window, keeping an eye on things. So um, Meme was, at this point, like I said, she was living in Paris, just trying to survive off the biographies sold about her. And she captured the interest of this guy, Lord Mombado, who, I, he's just got a great look, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he really does. And he was trying to use Meme to convince people of like what humanity's actual baseline was. And it, it was assumed in Europe at the time that humanity's baseline was this purity, the civilization. And he said, no, 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 no. It was actually, human's baseline is um, wildness and savagery and, and civilization is inculcated upon people. So he was obsessed with her for years until he became more interested in other feral children and he got bored and no one knows what happened to her. Yeah, I know. Um, just over and over again in Memi's life, people just kept on trying to use her. They tried to use her as a pet. They tried to use her as a demonstration of God's will. They tried to use her as a hunting partner, as a biograph biographical interest, and then finally as some sort of philosophical proof of something or other. But I, I think everybody in here agrees. What made Memi awesome is not how adaptable she is. What made her awesome is her pure instinct for survival. Her wildness isn't about society. Her wildness is about her. So many people forced Meme to live for their own purposes, not her own, but the best parts of her were authentic ones. The Meme who couldn't understand why her house guests didn't want to eat frogs. The Meme who beat a guy almost to death with a leg of raw meat. That's, that's the part that I want to raise my glass to tonight. <laughs> yeah. The, the true Meme, the one whose name has been lost to many.